Here we go, here we go, here we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're live on YouTube. And there we go. Now we're live on Instagram. It's so fast. Welcome, everybody. We're here for, I've got a banner. I got to use it. A double buddy read discussion. One was planned. One was sort of impromptu. <laughs> so I was just plastering up some book covers in the background. We're here to sort of ramble about these two books that we happen to read at about the same time. So let me welcome Leslie from Books, Gers, and Purrs. And hello, why don't you tell the lovely viewers uh, what they will find on your channel and how you're doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. Um, <laughs> what, can, what can you find on my channel? Books and more books. Um, right now for this year, I'm doing individual book reviews. So um, one will be a short non-spoiler review and a completely separate one that runs from a half an hour to an hour. It will be a spoiler chat in case you're interested if you've just read a book and you just want to be nice. able to say whatever you want <laughs> in the space. That's basically what I'm tackling. Okay. Were you expecting this to be a spoiler free zone or a spoiler video? Cause I thought about it and I was like, I could do either. We could do the first, maybe the first section non-spoiler, okay. I guess. I don't know. Okay. And then the rest. The you have two streams set up for these two books tomorrow. Are those spoiler free or with spoilers? Those are just two short, non-spoilers that's all i'm gonna do since we're chatting here as well okay okay so then i'm gonna probably slip in spoilers at the end that we can discuss things that uh, people can stop if they don't want to hear those okay so which books are we talking about we've got the reformatory by tanana reeve do who is on our list because of the black author tuber readathon so we may be the latest entry to finish up the february readathon on march 16th <laughs> And then it's completely my fault because I had the CD and I have nowhere to listen to a CD except in my car. And, you know, the driving just happened when it could around life. And so it got stretched out a little. But Leslie is one of the MVPs of the Black Author Tube Readathon reading how many books in February for it? I think six. six? <laughs> I lost count. Oh my gosh. See, I think I got four. So, you know, extra credit. Extra pretend. <laughs> um, and you want to tell us about the other book we're going to be talking about today? Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't have, um, I listened to it on, on the audio. So I just, um, I have it on my cell phone. Hannah <laughs> White. Welcome to Hainam Dung Bookshop. Can you see it? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah. how I have it. Yeah. A lovely, beautiful, cozy read. It's definitely about someone um, that's a middle-aged woman that realizes that in her life, um, although she's done what she thinks is everything right, uh, she needs to make a pivot in her life, much to the chagrin of the rest of her friends and family. And she, um, you know, it, it's definitely about um, accepting what you don't know, um, finding a moment in your life where it's time for a reinvention and reaching out to community. Nice. Pretty good. So we had an interview. Leslie was my tag teaming backstage stage manager for that one, which is awesome. It was 8 p.m. Pacific time, which was very late for folks on the East Coast, coast where Mighty Blaze is. And so I was like, I need to find a West Coaster. We need to be on the same <laughs> wavelength. So she joined me and we were both in on the interview, which I will pop into the chat if you're curious. It was our first Blaze translation interview. So we had the translator of the book interpreting for the author in real time. It was awesome. I thought we I thought it went really well. And so I definitely recommend that you check it out. Uh, we've got some, some jokers in the chat, but I wanted to <laughs> welcome the folks in the chat. Stargator and Barrett and just Eva and Anita. Welcome, welcome. Lovely to see you. I know Barrett and Eva were playing around earlier in some of the other chats. And so I'm envisioning like wally and eva you know when they're doing their little space dancing in the movie <laughs> <laughs> just hanging out and having fun poking fun at each other it's great um 
So yeah, so this is not a productivity sprint. This is the opposite. This is a ramble about two books. And I thought we could p tackle the reformatory first. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Let me put the... Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. The interview link. I have so many links on the side here. Um, the interview link for people to flag. So... Um, Reform reformatory so you gave a premise of the other book and i didn't even give a premise of the reformatory so tanana reeve Dew is one of the authors that was on my everyone saying good things about her especially brie and i was like i really should try like another crime horror writer and stretch my comfort zone so this is the one that was coming out and i thought i had a copy of it on libro.fm turns out i did not this is why the whole cd debacle happened but I chased it down, and the premise is the reformatory is like a reformatory school for boys, for uh, minors, but sometimes they go up to 20 years old, um, African-American and white that is loosely based on a school in northern Florida that was in operation from about 1900, and in the book, it's about 1950, and um, it's basically explaining the situation for people in Northern Florida and the Jim Crow South, and specifically this one boy who gets caught up in what is a fairly common uh, occurrence, it seems like. He's picked up by the law, he gets sent to the reformatory, and it's a place of horrors, and how does he deal with it? So really heavy subject. Um, how did you find the book in general? how did you expect to react to it and like what were your overall impressions before we get to details uh i i knew the premise and i did know that it was based on a a real uh location and uh i've read some material not about that specific location but just um more so about what's happened to the indigenous community in the past especially yeah. this past couple of years with um the uncovering what happened in uh in canada yeah. Um, so that was on my mind while I was reading this. Um, I'm trying to keep it short, but uh, I okay. think, I think like, maybe like, like, yeah, okay. yeah, that's true. Um, so yeah. I know what this is based on, and really the horror of all of, of the book is what happened in real life, not just in this uh, fiction retelling. Um, I think I wanted a little bit more of the spiritual creepiness to be in and it was actually more of a backdrop and so i was kind of surprised about about that, if that makes sense. okay i was surprised that the supernatural was in there at all oh okay <laughs> so i i wasn't expecting it to have supernatural elements so that i thought it was more like crime horror but like the supernatural elements were like oh and i enjoyed it because i guess i wasn't expecting it to be mostly about that but yeah yeah. So, the, so they reference Mariana in the book. And so when I look up Mariana, Florida, there's a little piece in Wikipedia, the Florida School for Boys uh, operated in Mariana from 1900 to 2011, folks, 2011, when it was finally investigated and closed. And it had a reputation for abuse, beatings, rapes, torture, all these things. And, you know, was part of a system. Um one of the things that the author points out in the author note, which I will, I really appreciate it. And, um, and it's not a spoiler for the story is that it's never one person. Like if you have a bad guy in your story and like, you're wondering what happens to them, fine and good, but it's never one person who's perpetuating the violence. It's the whole system that supports it. And I thought that was a really good point to, to hammer home in this case. So, um, not a military school. It's like a, juvie, like a juvenile hall, I think. And yeah, I it's like, it's kind of like a, a corrections for kids, for troubled kids, which yeah. basically just means the black and poor white kids. Right. But really, it's just disguising all the terrible things that are going on there. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah. So that was the Wikipedia entry. That was our expectations. Um appreciations is the next phase I had. So I was thinking that it would be about horror. It would be about history because I knew it was a historical um, 
And so the things I appreciated about it, one, the surprise that there was Supernatural was cool. And I don't know if that's a Tanana Reeve do signature or like only for this one. I'm curious about that. Um, she's really great at characters and setting. Like I had a very firm grasp. I've had other representations of like Jim Crow, Florida. Um, but I thought this was really well uh, drawn and the characters were very well fleshed out as well. They had their own motivations. They had their own worries that sort of weren't revealed to other characters. And so you got into different points of view and got to experience someone else's side of the same kind of horror. So it's the, it's the young boy and his sister, and they're sort of alone in the world because um, the mother has just recently passed away and the father has been run out of town and he's hiding out somewhere else where the Jim Crow South, you know, sheriff can't get him. So, um, so yeah, they're on their own and they're trying to look after each other. And that is really what sets up most of the tension at the beginning is that they only have each other to depend on, not anyone in the justice system, not, you know, anyone, um, at the school or the reformatory. And so I think that was a really good premise and like a way to set up high stakes. Um, so yeah, uh, appreciations. I have more, but I'll stop so that I'm not droning. <laughs> no, 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 I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, to piggyback off on how you're talking about setting, is it okay if I read a quote that I really liked? Yeah, yeah. Um, just so, so everyone gets an idea of... Um, what, what, it's really early on. I got it. Um, doo, 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 doo. Okay. So on page 17 through page 20, it says, on Florida soil, sometimes killing broke out for its own reasons. Florida's soul is soaked with so much blood. It's a wonder the droplets don't see between your toes with every step mama used to say. Sometimes when Gloria walked along McCormick Road, she thought she heard whimpering, oh, whimpers between, oh, be, beneath her footsteps. Papa's family had once been owned by the McCormicks, and both sides of the Mor McCormicks fence held long memories. And so I thought that was such a great way to say, um, actually, I like nature being involved in books anyways to tell a tale, because I always think about, um, I guess specifically, being in the United States and, and all the horrors that have happened specifically here, that there are trees on our land that are so old that in a way have been witness to everything mm. that's going on. Yeah. And so I thought that was important. And um, that was something about uh, setting and tone that I really loved about what the author wrote and also makes it clear that yes, uh, this is like historical fiction, but those are the horror elements in a way that they could walk and still feel that like history is like vibrating beneath them in a way. And yeah. I, I really love that. Yeah. So Barrett says we have some religious schools like that, that were private, that were closed here um, in Missouri recently after some investigative journalism uncovered the awful bits. Yeah. No. Um, Leslie's really correct in drawing the parallels between this type of state-run violence and the and the private religious um, examples that are most uh, famous or most well known, I should say, are the ones in Canada with residential schools. Um, but here's where the recent stuff comes up on the Wikipedia page. Um, State authorities closed the school in Florida in June 2011 and 2015. A multi-year investigation of the cemetery and grounds by the University of Florida, which was attempting to find undocumented burials on the grounds, so a lot like residential schools, revealed details of a, I mean, trigger warning. You don't get into this. It's just mysterious in the, the book, but uh, of a secret rape dungeon, it says. Um, it positively identified five bodies from remains recovered on the grounds and they've been exhuming remains, 55 more trying to locate um, and identify people through DNA. So it's really a very similar sort of situation that's been 
hushed up and amazingly recent. Like, yeah, super gross. Yeah. <laughs> so Florida, not always what you think about, but yeah, the, the portion of the state that is part of the South is very part of the South. And this type of thing can happen anywhere is kind of what, you know, we're prompted to think about. Um, so let's see, what else did I have? Um, the author note, the themes of family. So um, the brother and sister link starting out and the high stakes of that, um, Tanana Reeve Du points out in her family note that it was inspired by, I think, her mother's uncle who died in a you know juvenile detention center in the 30s, I think, who was named for who the character was named for, but this isn't anything to do with his story because his, his story is basically a blank. There's no, nothing in the records about him and she couldn't find anyone that knew him. So she created a fictional story, a fictional town, a fictional school, but it mirrors a lot of the occurrences and experiences of people who have testified to what's happened and everything. So really good historical fiction in terms of emotional depth and, descriptive strength and just like, yeah, bringing in a lot of different factors, both the town and the institution and the individual characters to work together really well. Yeah. And I also thought that um, that's a great way to honor her relative, especially since there's like you were saying, there's no data to find. Mm -hmm. And that happens so much. Um, I When I was reading this, I just keep thinking about not just American history, but American present time and yeah. how um, we really don't know certain people's names, especially uh, Black Americans, African Americans, until we see them in the news mm. after they've been murdered and for unjust reasons. And so now she's giving her relative a name and a backstory, making them into like this full human being and if not that would have just been lost yeah yeah um she also names uh people after her characters after her parents and points out uh points to the civil rights activism of her parents and like that was kind of neat to read about in the author's note too yeah yeah um i watched an interview with her like a couple of interviews after i read the book and she did mention that um in some ways, not the entire book, because there's like two different narratives that are being toggled between. But she wanted this to be in some ways like a retelling of To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. but not from the white character's perspective, right? But from the person that's on trial in that particular book. And we never get that perspective. And and so now we're we're getting that too, right? Between with these two siblings, um, I guess you could see what was going on with the father. Uh huh. Essentially, so I, th I thought that was really an interesting fact to find out. Interesting. I that didn't occur to me. That's a that's a cool thing to find out from an interview. So like you're experiencing the adult world and issues through children's eyes, and I think in To Kill a Mockingbird, it's because it's to remove you from the topic and give you some distance from it, so you can see how bizarre it is and how unfair and unreal like these prejudices are i don't know that that's the same reason uh yeah. i would say i think it's just making it more acute i think maybe because we're so acquainted with the story now that it was an effort to like put you in the head of the person who is experiencing it rather than the person watching it on the news maybe yeah maybe. yeah um okay okay uh resonances mm. separate category it's sort of melds with the first category <laughs> <laughs> um you're asking me you want me to go first <laughs> um okay so this the book has two different um like storylines that's being toggled right Robert? so it's Gloria. robert's yeah, Robbie's in, in the reformatory and um, his sister Grace is on the outside. She's just such a young kid. She's like 16 years old. Gloria. Gloria, sorry. I don't know why. It was a G name. Yeah, <laughs> I know right here. It is like Grace. 
she needed a lot of grace. <laughs> yeah. So um, Gloria is, we see through her such a, such a young kid that already because she's in the segregated uh, Jim Crow era, there's so much she already has to navigate. But now she's trying to do something that is, that as we as a present day reader know is like the impossible. You know, she's trying to um, figure out something in the justice system that's set up to work against her mm-hmm. and her family. Um, so that resonated with me. Again, historical fiction to the present, <laughs> yeah. just um, what's not working. And also, um, I'm constantly reminded of how the system is set up to when I walk out the door, the system is set up to um, work for someone that looks like me and work against everyone else. Mm-hmm. And so when we're reading this, we just see that every step she takes, okay, well now I gotta go through the back door. Okay, now I have to put on, um, how do I say this? The There's a constant masking of, I, I, I need to, Gloria needs to perform, right? This is performance of, of how do you say it? cordiality mm. that needs to be put on for her to survive and once again that's something that i constantly even when i've, I've read uh you gotta be you by brendan kyle goodman that's something that uh they talk about the first time they were ever at a store and realizing they were going to be seen as a a threat just to mm. go buy something right. so then they have to put on a big smile if they do and in the book she just realizes when she can open her mouth and when she can't, when right. she needs to say something. And if she missteps, just trying to say the truth that works against her. Right. So that, um, yeah, her, her whole experience resonated and every like, um, ooh, I don't know if I don't go too far, but just seeing how much her and people like her, even adults, are constantly trying to like, uh, how do I say it? Work the back end <laughs> of things, like having to meet secretly or um, and make it clear, like, hey, just us talking is dangerous because the story is proliferating. <laughs> and so, um, who can she turn to? Even the people she can turn to really can't do anything, you know. And again, that's because there's a system in place to work against her. And her brother, yeah, her whole family, basically. So that you're, yeah, you're reminding me of something that I felt from the beginning. So just to let y'all know, the CD version was 17 CDs. So I had to break it up, and it didn't have like a change the speed feature. And Jonice Aberpratt reads it very slowly in a southern drawl, and so that's why it took me so long as well. Oh and um. So yeah, a long time ago, I'm trying to remember the beginning, the beginning part I was really impressed with. I've seen this on some podcasts and TikToks that women will point out they know what men are going to do before the men know they're going to do it because the predator is more observant. Sorry, the prey is more observant of the predator than vice versa. So when you think about like women like men men saying uh women don't know what men's experiences are don't tell us what we're like and it's like no they do because they've had to learn because they don't want to be hurt and so i feel like in every situation where there's like an oppressed party they have had to observe more closely and be very prepared and have strategies for survival um in cases where it's it's violently dangerous, you know? And so that came to the fore in this. I definitely saw Gloria as someone who was like zeroing in on, is this the time to say it? Can I say this? Do I walk on that land? Do I not go there? Do I ask the judge? Like all these little decisions, how is she going to be perceived? Not like what a different person would be able to do. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I thought that really powerful and you know unfortunately still applicable um but it's interesting that i've heard that on tiktoks and you know back in 1950 Mm -hmm. same same old bs yeah um what about confusions or dissatisfactions and then we'll we'll ask if we have favorite characters so we end up on a on a high note oh my gosh favorite characters i mean all right 
Um, much like you had 17 CDs. <laughs> yeah. How, how was your format experience? Um, I had, I borrowed the book from the library and I listened to uh, the book on audio. So I was dual listening because I saw how huge it was. And I'm, he, even though we both read, clearly this is a book community, we read frequently, but once I have a massive book in front of me, I get so overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did both. Yeah. And and yes, the the uh, the person, the narrator, does read quite slowly, and there's these big gaps between words, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So I was listening to it at a speed I usually don't, which is 1.7, and it was still as clear as day, and it still felt like uh, it was <laughs> it was an uphill battle to get through in some ways. And I think that was actually not, it wasn't just the audio. It was a pacing of the book. Mm. Um, I think I wanted to feel a sense of uh, urgency, more so from Gloria, uh, not her as a character, but the pacing of her chapters. I oh. wanted it to feel like she's running and I wanted us to feel that tension. And yeah. I didn't, even though, we understand how um, mm, dangerous and important, uh, and there is a sense like I just know that from what they're going through, but I didn't feel that in reading her chapters. It just felt like, and I don't know what what could be different because, um, okay. And then something else was the character Wait, of her, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I actually had a similar. Um, feeling, and I'm glad to hear you say that because sometimes when I'm feeling something about pacing, it's wildly different for different people. But mm -hmm. besides the narration, I think the text itself was uh, slowed down a little bit because every moment is magnified. It feels like mm -hmm. we do have the notifications or the um, reminders that you know it's it's this many days till their attempt at meeting and it's this many days since he's gotten in and it's this many days till like she's gonna have to do something so we do get reminders that that emphasize the urgency of the situation but because we are in every moment and we're in their heads and they're thinking about this or that or that time back then when i have a memory about my dad or like previous trauma that's coming into this moment it's, it does slow it down in terms of feeling like action is progressing. I think those are valuable details. And I think, I don't think there's a, a better way to introduce them, but it does mean that you have to sort of digest it slowly. And for people who are used to, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> <laughs> that works really fast, that can be an adjustment. So I will say that just, yeah. yeah. Like I felt like I liked the pacing of Robbie's Hmm. He he needs his character needs that because it's like um because mm. to he be needs in a place to concentrate on every minute to get by right yes so yeah. the fact that the time feels that way makes sense hers right. didn't but like like you're saying I wouldn't even know what to cut out because it's all important <laughs> there's not like a bit of fat in, in the story and if anything um my second like uh I guess you could say critique was. Not that this book needs to be any larger, but I guess I'm asking that at the same time. Um, the main characters and supporting characters all have uh, are fully uh, fleshed out characters. I like their development. There were two characters I wanted more from, and I almost Ooh. wanted their own chapters. And that is Gloria and Robert's dad. I would have liked all those flashbacks, all those things that we learn to actually be, I wanted him to have his own chapters in between. And when we're reading from Robbie and Gloria's uh, chapters, if we just didn't know, like they, it was written in a way that like, dad's not here, he can't be, but that we slowly figure out what happened and why he can't be there. Uh -huh. Cause then that would have brought the horrors of what he went in, um, and pr even though it's in the past, like present time, but we would have seen like what played out and the horrors of that. And that would have added to what's going on generationally Yeah. at the same time. I thought that would work really effectively. Um, and the other thing is, uh, I don't know why I can't think of his name because I keep trying to forget his name. <laughs> uh, I know. 
<laughs> what's his name? The the guy from the the boss in the reformatory? Paddock. Yeah, Paddock. Okay, cool. Uh not I don't want him to be centered in any way, but I would like some of the thoughts he had at, towards the end to be knowledge early on. I just wanted certain things to be more like uh I just wanted some some more gnarly stuff from his character. Not that I'm asking for any more violence to happen, but yeah. just like psychologically for me to not understand him, but just kind of really get an idea of who this person is, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, let me... Let I'm me... also trying to say this vaguely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll have a little spoiler section for the reformatory and then we'll return in like maybe 10 minutes, five minutes to you'll see it go down if you're if you're muting us. Um so what do you mean by the thoughts that go through? Like him with his baby sister? So we see yeah. a lot of points of violence in Haddock's life, and it starts mm -hmm. with his baby sister when he's a child who he killed. And we're like, wow, that's like sociopath, psychopath, sorry, at a young age. So, what, yeah. Yeah, so Haddock shows Robbie a photo of, I guess, his serial killer photo log or whatever. Um, and one is of his sister, or I guess like the first picture, whatever, that he shows them. I just wanted us to have knowledge. Um, I, I'm just going to talk like horror serial killer way, but... I wanted to know, like, maybe he has thoughts about who he murdered before and how much he enjoyed that. And specifically that those last thoughts of him and his sister. Um, and just taking responsibility for what he did to her. I kind of wanted some of that earlier on, if that makes any sense. I just wanted more... Uh, certainty, you mean? or Yeah, just more certainty or just like more... How, how gnarly this guy, like how nefarious is this person? If that makes well, any sense. So for me, it was pretty, it was figured out by the boys in the reformatory that mm -hmm. he had killed his, his baby sister. And like some of the ghosts were telling him that and like, how haven't you figured that out? And I was like, well, I was thinking it might be, but I wasn't sure. Cause we're in Robbie's point of view and he doesn't know anything as a new person. So, um, I think the certainty pacing was all right. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I could have taken or, or, or left his whole, like, oh, she's come back to get me or like, I don't know what we were doing in his head at the end. It just felt like another slowdown to me because I was like, they're still in the Creek. They're still dogs. Like, what, what are we doing here? Like slowing down for the villain point of view. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Or, or, or if, if, because that happened, then why didn't we get more of the sister throughout? haunting mm. him or something because there are already these like upset angry spirits yeah so if she's there lingering in some way she should have been lingering throughout yeah and we, we only get her yeah. when he's becoming paranoid towards the end i see what you mean yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah. and didn't really i don't know yeah. babies maybe it's because i'm not a big baby person that that didn't really face me <laughs> <laughs> Like people with personalities. Show me the people with personalities. Um, okay, I think that's all the spoilers we need. I'm gonna take it away. Um, so I, like you, had trouble remembering names at the end because I'm listening to it and I'm not writing notes down as I go because I was driving. So um, now I'm not gonna say my favorite characters, but I'm gonna say my most interesting. Um, so the ones that made it a more complex story. And that was the title of this is like complex books and rambly booktubers. Um, mm -hmm. So I did like that. They had a little slice of the relationship between Gloria and her employer. So like the white lady who's in the justice system and how she's conflicted because she has family that are assholes. And also like, doesn't believe th the things that should be the way they are in some ways, but we're getting like intersectionalism there. And I really liked that it was sort of poked at. Um, so I like her, Miss Anne. Miss yeah. 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 It was Anne. There we go. Yeah. Pow. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the other one I can't remember is the other door warden. So not Crutcher, but the one who is like the Hank teacher who was always oh, yeah, 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 yeah. J, but I can't remember. So yeah. we don't know all of the um, employees at the reformatory. We basically just get to know the warden and the two um, black door keepers who are like house house wardens, I guess. Um, and we get different viewpoints from each of them. So I liked that we had um, different gradations and yeah, just yeah. not everything is cut and dried or all decided. So I liked, did you find his name? No, I was, I'll, while you're answering, I'm like, I was trying to, but I can't, but um, I'll let you finish and then I'll. Uh, well, those are the two characters I was going to point out. And then okay. I was going to go maybe back a little bit towards like confusions or dissatisfactions. First, I wanted to say hi to Richard Holiday, And, oh, uh, I skipped one. Yes, you missed out. But we're still talking about the reformatory, which is horror. So, you know, I'm actually reading a historical horror. Sounds like some hellish industrial, not exactly, nightmare where organic matter is ground up and reformed into burgers. No, it's not that kind of horror. Um, let's Ooh, see. let me know. I just want to say something about my favorite characters. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I just, before we continue, yeah. um, Gloria's, I think, considered her aunt Lottie, uh huh, and Mrs. Hamilton. So, Miss Lottie is the godmother. And... Oh, yeah, 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 there she goes. Is she, she the one where the, she pulls something out of the laundry basket? Remember when she gets pulled yes. over? Yes, I don't want, I don't know if you want to <laughs> talk about that in a spoiler way, but um. It's I just not, like it doesn't ruin okay. anything. We don't know when it occurs. Yeah. Um. All right. So Mrs. Hamilton, I'll start there. I like that we see that here's someone that is a teacher. She cannot change what's going on. She's only one person, but she tries to show up in the way that she can. Mm -hmm. Um. And so the kids getting a chance to play musical instruments to express themselves when they're like living in this like house of horror is a way to see any type of light <laughs> at the end of this very dark tunnel. Yeah. Um, and I appreciated that because um, sometimes when things are, are so dark and maybe people feel like they can't do anything, we think about huge grand things we could do instead of like maybe all the little things and i thought that was a beautiful nod to someone that was just um trying to put their their foot in the door right um yeah. the, the so, other thing go ahead just as a background mrs hamilton volunteers as a music teacher because in this reformatory um it's a big employer in the town that's one reason they want don't want to close it down um, but the warden also uses the students for a football team that has won championships, which is odd that they can compete, and a band that marches in the parade. So that's why there's a music band and a group. And it was interesting. I liked that he had like a moment where he was not scared when Robert learns he's going to be a trumpet player. And I like that little like vision of the future if we have a future. Um, I thought that was a little bit of a cut short and because we don't see her um, much outside of that, but it did connect two characters who were connected at the end. And so I'm like, okay, maybe it needed for some plot cohesiveness, but like it felt bigger than maybe um, we had time for or bandwidth for. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But I do well, like, I, yeah. I also liked, sorry, Lottie. I just, I loved her. I love the, the idea that there's this older woman that's a badass in her own right and that we're seeing her character through, uh, uh, what did I keep wanting to say the wrong name? Yes. Gloria. And how um, even when she gets like frustrated, she, I think Lottie said, at some point says, I can't remember if it was Lottie or Anne, I think it was Lottie, was saying like, you don't know what ways basically I have to be brave and what I've done, you know, um, for all her years of living. Um, and also I love that. Well, not love, but there's this is very like uh, scary 
uh, filled with tension moment where they get pulled over and Lottie is just like, she's ready. At, in this moment, it's whatever I need to do. And that, that was like really scary, but I thought really badass at the same time. I didn't know if there was anything underneath there. I don't know if she was just like faking, like bluffing. So yeah, that's exciting. I like Miss Lottie. Um, yes. What was the other thing that I was going to say? You just reminded me. Oh, so like many sort of blended families, mixed families, families of choice, Miss Lottie has children who are not biological children, but who are uncles to Robbie and Gloria. And so they come into the story at some point. And so we meet them. One is an army veteran who's been given trouble because he wears his army uniform post-World War II to church on Sunday. And of course, he points out directly what is usually the quiet part, which is that white folks in the South don't like seeing any reminders that black folks, black men have been um, able to kill people without repercussions because that's supposed to be their part or their power. And so that was like a little bit of a wave um, created. And I liked his character for the places, for the points that he brought up. And then the other uncle is also interesting. He worked at the reformatory for a few months. I think it's the other one, right? It's not the same uncle. So mm -hmm. he was there for about five months as a groundskeeper and was sort of observing the system. I was like, you know what? This is doing weird things to my health and sanity and I'm not going to continue. And so he, he quit and, um, that was a, a pivotal role in the story, even though it's a very background event. So I like I like that layering and yeah. really well woven together um, pieces for the action. So that was that was something I liked. What, as well. what did you think of Blue? Okay, so <laughs> should I put the spoiler thing up? <laughs> um, da, 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 da. Uh, here we go. So in this story, there's lots of supernatural visitations. And one of the biggest, or not biggest, one of the first twists is that we hear about these two friends that Robbie makes in the reformatory when he gets in, Redbone and Blue. And Blue, the first twist, is that he's a ghost. And I did not know that. And I felt a little cheated when it was revealed because I was like, but... But there was no way to know that. Like, there were things that might have left it a little bit ambiguous, but he closed a door. He traps them in the freezer. I'm like, ghosts can't do that. Apparently, they can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know, right? Um, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah. What did I think about him? I liked the rule at the end that said, ghosts can be your friends, but you have to look out for yourself. Because I think what you what you said in our in our Voxer conversation at one point is really is really true that like once you're you're once you've had so much bad stuff done to you and you've been hanging around bad stuff being done for so long like yeah. I mean your your motivation changes <laughs> you know yeah well that and I kind of felt like it, it's, this is just me like. Um... Yeah, just my thoughts on it. It's not like that, like the author is saying this, but um, I felt like, well, here are these these kids, human kids, and they die such violent deaths. And so I thought, well, maybe when they become spirits, that's just um, part of their metamorphosis is to be angry because they died in violence. Right. You know. So. So. Um, on your point of like nature reflecting things yeah. like the being blood red and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of like the same thing with the ghost world. Cause if you're killed in a violent situation, like there's some coloring of emotion that goes into the residue in your spirit in my mind anyway, yeah. like yeah. that yeah. danger. It's like this residue of evil that is clinging to you, even though you're the innocent party as the ghost. And so yeah. like you're coming back to avenge. And I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, or that also speaks to um, how that generational trauma gets passed on, right? That's just like the spiritual version of it, in a way. Like violence begets violence. How would I mix those two? 
I would say in terms of intergenerational trauma, if you're not working it out, you're stuffing it down, right? So if you don't have the tools and Mm -hmm. you don't have access to things to help you process that and sort of exercise that, that evil that's been done to you and sort of work through it, then I think you stuff it down, you have disease, you have like tension, you have some kind of unresolved feeling. And I think that's what will mess with your, your DNA and whatever the little hook on the end of the DNA is that they, they say is um, uh, instrumental in that. Um, So how, how would that work? Well, I guess like in terms of passing down violence, yeah, like sometimes mm, if someone's raised in a violent home and they don't have any other example, Potentially, when they have kids, they must think, may think, well, this is just something that I passed down. Yeah. Because no. I'm supposed to be a good citizen or whatever. So I'm going to do this to you. Not that that's correct thinking, but I think that kind of ex- um, ta- speaks to how like violence gets passed down. Okay. In some well, ways, not all. Different approach. Because what I was thinking is that people know it's bad and they're just unable to do differently because of the bottled emotion and i think what you're saying is like people are normalized to think this is how you live your life like you need this toughening up in order to to be a good person or to have honor or to be strong or whatever the prevailing bs is so um yeah those are different arguments i mean they could this at the same time as well Mm -hmm. but i'd have to think more about like if the ghosts are a metaphor of that because it's I am I'm not paralleling them immediately right now. So I can't. No, that's okay. No, that's okay. And you yeah. also don't have the degree. So yeah, I get it. I hear you. Um okay, so wow. I think I'm done. Spoilers with- are done. <laughs> Back to the regular. Um surprises, supernatural. Um maybe like who would you recommend this book to or it would it be good for a certain readathon? Like, it's definitely uh, historical fiction. It's definitely horror. Yeah. It's definitely like African American themes mm-hmm. and issues of the like trauma of the history of being an African American. Um, there are little moments of joy as well, but I would say that's definitely in the minority <laughs> in the book. So it's like if you're worried about reading a heavy read and reading a light read, if you're someone who sort of mixes them so that you can read the hard stuff, I'd say this is definitely a heavy read, but really well done. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely worth reading. Um, Even if someone doesn't have any knowledge and doesn't maybe know where to start um, when it comes to... I keep, I keep thinking of like residential schools, but basically like these type of schools that existed and, and how you pointed out ended in 2011, you know, um, I think yeah. this is a great place to start. And the horror genre has definitely been a good place to explore um, the horrors of reality itself. So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I'm not a horror reader, but I think I've read, I've read like two, maybe three, three horror books because of book two, book two made me and you know, I'm not sorry. So it could happen. It could happen. Make your pitch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you, re- you read more widely in terms of that genre or. Yeah. Not- I, I don't really horror that much. I, but I'm up for any genre, especially, um, I tend to, to gravitate towards um, social injustices. So this book is up my alley when it comes to that. Yeah. And also um, learning about a piece of history I didn't know, but through fiction was yeah. like, um, it's kind of, it's helpful in a way to get like someone's toes wet in those particular topics, yeah. for lack of a better word. Um, and to kind of, like you said, you started digging into it right you read something in the book and then you're like okay let me look this up yeah and that's what um the author did really well is kind of creating this fictional world but then tying real historical places to it that us as a reader could go off and research and then what am i going to do i'm going to go pick up some more books about that topic you know and so i really like that 
Right. Speaking of history and fiction, hey, Emma. How's your historical book going? <laughs> I know you're taking a break, I think, but just checking in, saying hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, yeah. So, success. We finally finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tanana Reeve Dew, great writer. Very excited to have her, like, now being read. Any yeah. other final thoughts? Or are you ready to switch over to cozy Korean literature? Um, final thoughts. Oh, um, it's a heavy book. <laughs> Maybe read something in between if, if that's possible, um, which is exactly why this next book was refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, how many stars did I give to uh, the reformatory? I don't think I've rated it yet on Storygraph. I just finished it yesterday on the drive here. So mm -hmm. I think I'm going to give it 4.25. Um, we'll see if that changes by the time I get to it <laughs> but yeah, yeah four stars for me is definitely like a solid good read and between four and five is really more of an indication of did it hit me in my sweet spot and yeah did it cater to the things that I like um, in a book so yeah. yeah we also have a poll now might be a good time to check in with the poll I put on here. Um, before knowing anything about either book, which looks more your style? And we had eight votes. 50% said both yes, which is an interesting <laughs> population. Okay, okay. And then 38% said Hunam Dong Bookshop. Okay, so that's what we'll get to next. And and 12%, I think that's probably one person, said neither. That might be Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and so my question was, well, why are you here? Okay. Uh, <laughs> not to be rude, just to be funny. Um, so the next one, the second part here is because um, I asked Leslie to help me with the interview for this book. I got a, an arc from the publisher through A Mighty Blaze, and she was my backstage manager for the virtual interview two days ago. I was like, what day is it? Two days ago, <laughs> yeah. really well, so I definitely recommend you. I have put it in the chat to check it out. Um, it's by Wong Bolroom, a Korean writer, and translated by Shanna Tan. So, did you listen? I just I listened. I couldn't uh, grab a copy of the book in time, who but um, oh, who was it read by? I will look at that right now. I'm an audiobook person now so i want to make sure to give them their limelight it's narrated by rosa escoda i hope i'm saying the last name correctly e-s-c-o-d-a nice but I, I loved it the way that they read was so well paced i didn't have to listen to it at um too much of a higher speed okay so I'll ask you the first question I asked them, which was like, where would you put this in the bookstore? Where would you shelve it in terms mm. of category? Because it's a novel, but the elements in the novel and the themes in the novel are, well, I don't want to color your view. Say your ideas. <laughs> out there, and then we can talk. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It was a fiction. It was a cozy read. I don't think. I guess I kind of work backwards. I don't think it belongs in romance. Um, I would agree. I also think maybe there are elements of like, it could be self-help, but it's still fiction. But I still felt like that definitely yeah. applied. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it belongs in the YA section either. It could, but I don't think so. I, no, so that's where I'm yeah. landing. Yeah. So yeah, I would say cozy novel, um people call it slice of life i called it mm. what i call it midlife coming of age but i definitely felt pulled towards like inspirational or self-help which mm -hmm. is like how to live your life and i brought up a book that i read for may of the moderns which is how do you live which is a japanese sort of classic about young boys and so that is a yeah a, yeah a ya novel <laughs> you got there inspirational YA novel, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Like that's sort of how I see this for an older population. Um, 
not like older, but like not YA. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what am I doing to myself here? Um, <laughs> yeah. So as I said, I read it for a mighty blaze, which is an organization of volunteers that uh, interviews authors and gets the word out about great books that you should be reading new releases and all different genres. We have eight shows a week. I think four are like every week and then others sort of bop in from time to time. So it's a great organization to be a part of. And I'm going to pin the link, but I'm going to ask you a question first. Expectations. What did you think going in based on like my invitation? Um, I, I actually didn't have any expectations. I, <laughs> to be honest, I think um, I genuinely only picked it up because I thought, what well, I should at least read this <laughs> if I'm, if I'm going to have like the author in front of me out of respect. So overachiever, <laughs> overachiever. <laughs> so I also, I, I have, there's um another uh, book tuber, Russell from paper, ink and paper blog, something like that, that gave this book rave reviews. Oh. So it was on my radar. I just didn't know if I was going to, like it or if I was in the mood for it um so yeah I'll go back to it was surprisingly refreshing after the month of trauma <laughs> we attached ourselves yeah. and then uh Tanana Reeve Du came in with like a uh, industrial strength yeah. stapler gun and was like I'm gonna staple this to you <laughs> and you'll never forget <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah uh yeah, so my expectations, you can see that I took notes. I mean, I went through in the knowledge that I was going to be interviewing someone. So I was trying to pick out things that were like themes or maybe author statements that I could ask about. But I also had some just like fun passages and like good humor parts. Um, so I really enjoyed it. It was similarly, uh, I read this before before February? They were at the very beginning of February, a long time ago now. Mm. And, um, I enjoyed it. It was like sun, not sunbathing, forest bathing, and that you're kind of like still and quiet and just like getting nourishing sunshine kind of feeling. <laughs> That's mm. how I would describe reading this book. Um, I also have some to compare it to. So I just started, and this took me like an hour this morning because I'm a dork, but I started compiling a while ago uh, books about books on my story graph and also mm -hmm. books about bookshops, like set in bookshops or libraries, etc. And then I was like, oh, I should make a recommendations list on bookshop.org too. So I did that this morning. Um, <laughs> because the other two that immediately popped to mind, well, one is on the screen right now but that was an additional one. The other two are actually uh, translated as well. So I was like, I have a trio of translated books about bookshops. That is super cool. So we have from the Korean, we have from the Japanese, Days at the Morisaki Bookshop. Have you heard of that one? No, I haven't. Okay, so let me grab the link to the review. I had to hunt it down, which is why it took so long. Um, Days at the Mori Shop, Morisaki Bookshop. Uh, I, for some reason, had a very busy period in July and August because of the fireside chats where I did not write the names of the books that I talked about in the description. So I couldn't search them and it wasn't on my thumbnail because I just said wrap up number four. And I was like, oh, when did I do this? And I didn't write it down. Like I didn't record when I read it. So I had to go hunting and find <laughs> these books. So neatly uh, corralled for you. I have these two here and I um, linked the link to the part in the wrap up where they start for your But uh, Days at the Morisaki Bookshop is um, a Japanese book that is about uh, two family members, a young woman who's gotten out of a relationship that was pretty obsessive and is like depressed. She doesn't have anywhere to go. She can't pay for her apartment in the city. She goes to this like suburban bookshop lane where there's all sorts of bookstores in one neighborhood. And I was like, Bill, my brother, is that real? And he's like, yeah. And I said, do you live near there? And he's like, not really. It's like half an hour or whatever. And I was like, 
okay. And I put it right on my Google map or like whenever I visit him, I'm going there. <laughs> so that was really cool. It was about family relationships. It's about her sort of relearning what's important and like reassessing and reinventing. Um, so that was really great. The other one is uh, the door to door bookstore, which is translated from the German and door to door bookstore is um, this one old guy. So it's more like a senior citizen, kind of the trend of those uh, funny novels about senior citizens who are assassins or whatever, but he's <laughs> a shop worker and he just does his round of delivering books by hand and then it comes to like the bookshop owner wants to push him out and like make him retire, but he really doesn't have anything else in his life that brings him joy. So he wants to keep doing it. So he does it anyway. And then he develops this friendship with a young girl who's like bored and sort of precocious. And so she starts following him around and then they start having little missions and like it just develops really beautifully. So that's also a great cozy bookstore book. So if you're looking for more those are recommendations. Um, did this bring up any comparable books that you have read? Like other set in bookshops, set in libraries, cozy reads, anything of the same kind of feel? Well, since you read <laughs> Bookshops and Bone Dust, actually, um, the other book, uh, Legends and Lattes, I kept thinking about that because even though it's in a cafe setting, this is still about a character that, um, and also, Legends and Lattes is a fantasy cozy read, but it really is about a character that um, decides to pivot in their life, has an idea of what they want to do, not really sure how to make it all happen, but they really do start this um, coffee shop on just that dream. And this character learns how to um, reach out to communities in ways that they haven't for basically learning to ask for help. Mm. Um, and the community really shows up for this character. And you really just fall in love with all the other characters around them. Yeah. And I think that really speaks to um, the character in this book, looking at their life, realizing what's going on um, isn't really working for them and that they have to pivot, even mm. though like the unknown is scary, but they still take that leap. And so mm. I just kept thinking about Legends and Lattes when I read this book. She's a sword wielding adventurer. I can totally see the parallels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but not not an ogre or not an orc. Sorry, no orc. Hey, there you go. Close enough. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> yeah. I will read that. That's definitely on my list. I just don't have it yet. It's it's very cute. Yeah, I'm sure I will find a used copy soon. Um, so expectations, appreciations. So I had a whole bunch of quotes that I didn't get to read during the interview because we were trying to keep it like her able to talk instead of saying things that needed to be translated and taking up time. Um, but here's one of the appreciations. I have a, have a little tag on page two. Um, so Yongju is the bookstore owner. And like you said, she just realizes something is wrong and she needs to change. And we have this episode at the beginning, which is just illustrative of where she is at the beginning. And she has this sort of arc journey of learning about her life through other people. And so someone is waiting outside her door to get in at the beginning. And she's having this moment of thinking about like, wow, how far I've come. Someone's eager to get in. Um, so she interacts with him and he leaves. The moment she stepped inside, she relaxed as if her body and senses basked in the comfort of returning to her workplace. In the past, she used to live by mantras like passion and willpower, as if by imprinting the words on her mind, they would somehow breathe meaning, meaning into her life. It only felt like she was driving herself into a corner. From then on, she resolved never to let those words dictate her life again. Instead, she learned to listen to her body, her feelings, and be in happy places. She would ask herself these questions. Does this place make me feel positive? Can I be truly whole and uncompromisingly myself? Do I love and treasure myself here? For young Jude, the bookshop checked all the boxes. And I was like, yes! <laughs> yeah. But that's why there's like these little like self-help messages. Because as she's 
sort of checking into these lessons and going, no, this is the right philosophy for me. We can kind of go, oh, yeah, I never asked myself that. Maybe I should. <laughs> I think you used the correct phrase of check-in. That's exactly I, that's exactly what I was thinking. Is yeah. the ways that we do or don't check in with ourselves, mm. like consciously, yeah. um, to move with intent, you know, in mm. all the ways. Yeah. Um, so it's funny that you bring up legends and lattes because there is a coffee place in this book. And I was talking with you a little bit after the interview and how I was amazed. It took me many chapters before I realized this was a coffee place that only served coffee, not lattes, not mochas. There's nothing but coffee beans and water people. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> that is serious. That is like purist. So, um, yeah, she sort of didn't answer the question about researching coffee and being a purist because she just said she can't drink it anymore, which is sad for many people. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so I like that there's like it's a, another parallel with legends and lattes. What's an appreciation for you that's not about theme, but maybe about a character? Oh, gosh. Um, or a setting or a, like a, le a lesson or whatever. Um Oh, shoot. Hold on. I'm thinking that I feel like the main character. Hold on. Wait, could you ask that question again? I'm going to make sure I answer you correctly. What is an appreciation for you that's about a character? Okay. Or um, <laughs> I, th I think for the character. Kind of, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to repeat myself, though. I like because I think it's really hard for someone to pivot in life because we're um when when you don't see something when you have to use your imagination rather than having solid answers it's a huge risk and so for her to look at her life and know that she's not like in a bad situation or anything she just knows i've done everything right but this isn't working and i think that knowledge enough is profound and to to act on it um even more so um knowing not knowing where it's gonna go so i really i don't know i just really loved her character and um how she's willing to self-criticize like in a positive way um for example it's 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 simple but i think i really loved it which is early on when she's um talking to customers and trying to recommend books yeah she realizes oh i'm only recommending what i like and she's like no 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 this is about community i have to ask questions i have to be like what have you read recently what worked for you what didn't all the nuances of that mm. to be of service to others in that way and because it's not going to work she can talk about what book she likes all she wants but that person's in front of her <laughs> they're like that's not what i'm looking for Eating and, people um, yes 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 um to really like hear the person in front of you mm -hmm. and to be present and uh really hear what what their needs are it's all those little simple things that i really loved about her character yeah so one of the things you said at the beginning which is seeing something um that that is invisible to a lot of people so um I was kind of thinking about that when I was talking about the Mars house, like two interviews ago, but there's an incidence in here too, that is sort of related. So let me see if I can relate it in a way that makes sense outside my brain. Um, so like when you are a person who is in an achiever society and you're used to going down set expectations and um, meeting people's demands and, you know, I don't know, like going down the expected path, basically. Um, you don't see, I think, a lot of options because you're trained not to. It's like you have blinders. Mm -hmm. So there's like the whole world out there, but you're like, well, there's this promotion or, you know, there's like all of nature, but like the, you know, tree trimmer outside is too noisy for me to finish this report. Like you're not <laughs> able to, you know, see all the things and all the wonder. Um, 
and you're not you're not able to see that the taken for granted things aren't necessarily healthy like it's just accepted it's normalized so i thought um this line on page 174 kind of stopped me in my tracks and i was like oh yeah yeah that's recognizing that our ways aren't so healthy um, so this is actually in Song Chul's point of view. We get a little bit of the book in the point of view of an author who comes to give classes at Youngju's uh, bookshop. And Song Wu, yes, sorry, I said Song Wu. So he's uh, getting nervous about giving this presentation and like trying to calm him, calm himself down. Um, and so. Uh, Let's see, where should I start? He wasn't quite sure which side of himself he would be showing today. Probably just making a fool of myself. The thought made him less nervous. Over the next couple of hours, he was bound to be flustered, whether because of her, Yongju, or the talk. He was certain that he would sound awkward, look awkward. He couldn't even be his normal self, much less perform at his very best. In that case, he might as well do away with the greed of wanting to do well. As long as he wasn't bothered by how others might view him, he had already successfully avoided the worst case scenario. And it was the phrase, the greed of wanting to do well, that I was like, oh, yeah, that is an expectation that's impossible. Why do we do that to ourselves, you yeah. know? And so I thought the ability to be so rational and reasonable and like, actually listening to yourself checking in going okay this is not my normal self this is a challenge so i can't expect myself to be normal why am i putting so much pressure on myself to be spectacular like okay bring it down a few notches like we'll be awkward it's fine um and that 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 expectation is the kind of greed like and that really made me think oh yeah greed capitalism that fits with the whole model yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Small thing, small thing, but like it was, it was kind of a big, um, aha uh -huh moment connection. Yeah. 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 No, I, I love, I just felt like, I don't know if, because this is a translation. I don't know how much I could attribute how it's laid out to translation, but uh -huh. I loved how, um, like plain oh, spoken. Out. And easy it is to digest, but uh -huh. the subject matter is so deep for a cozy read. Uh -huh. So speaking back to, I guess, expectation, I just didn't know. Cozy reads, it's like, I can't tell, is it surface level? What is it? But um, there's plenty of symbolism and plain spokenness um, that works really well. I think there is a lot of the author in the author character because they were a software engineer not software an engineer of some sort and like <laughs> they attached attacked bad grammar and were very rational it was just a hobby but like they started getting into grammar like it was a fun hobby and you know hey why not and then started writing things on the basis of that because it was enjoyable and so um that's what that makes me oh i lost my train of thought <laughs> <laughs> The connection from the author to the character. Yes. What did you bring up before that, though, that that was attaching to? <laughs> Are we? <laughs> this is going to show our age. Um, I yeah. think the plain spokenness and the, even though it's plain spoken, like easy to read, but also there's so much depth. Yes. And I think that's less the translator and more the author original work, mm -hmm. because I think if she put that in a character, I think that's going to be like part of her mission is to make her book also like mm -hmm. solid, reasonable, understandable, clear, you know? Yeah. And, like, yeah. Part of her mission. Yeah. 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 I do like, even though this is from the, the other interview, I like in the interview how um, the translator spoke to leaving elements of the original language so that us as the reader would have to do some work. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. And not even do the work, but just like get a little bit of familiarity, you know, yes. like every little bit makes it feel less foreign and more like, oh, I've been through this before and it's not such a stretch. It's not such a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, how about other 
resonance areas. So I've got the bestseller comment. So, okay, not only does every bookshop worker have to think through recommendations, which she goes into and like has a whole system about how to make recommendations, but every owner has also thought through, do I carry the bestsellers? How big is my friggin' James Patterson section? You know, like... <laughs> When I worked at a used bookstore, I just, I, ha I took umbrage at the fact that there was a whole bookshelf devoted to James Patterson. Because I was like, you can get him anywhere. He comes out with a new thing or two every year. Like, and you can get him in the library. This is not something that we love to read. Why is it here in this small bookshop? Like, why is this part of our specialty? And, um... Yeah, he is great in that he does award money to independent bookstores every year as like part of a fund, which is fantastic. But in terms of his books, like, I don't know, giving you something to get excited about, that's not my taste. So when she talks about the bestseller section, um, page 293, I can read that part too. Um. Gradually, she became convinced that bestsellers were the reason the publishing industry had lost its diversity. Mm. Standing in front of the bestseller section in major bookshops felt like looking at the state of the publishing industry, highly skewed toward a few bestseller titles. Whose fault was it? Nobody's. It was simply a reflection of a society which doesn't read. Faced with this reality, what booksellers should do, even if they only played a small role, was to introduce a diverse range of books to customers to show them the publishing world wasn't made up of only a few bestsellers or big shot authors, to impress upon them that there were many more awesome books and authors out there waiting to be discovered. <laughs> and of course, I can't imagine why that like hit a uh, resonation with me. Resonance resonated. Yeah. Yeah. I almost feel like <laughs> um, that's making me think of ideas of this imaginary bookshop that we have. <laughs> <laughs> to piggyback off that, there could be two, two categories. One would be not specific to that, but would, would be, um, there would be like, you know how they have those, what do you call it, like pyramid style book section? It could, it could say like anti bestseller. <laughs> You mean like a feature, like a feature yes. or an end yes. cap at the end of yes. a row? Okay. Yeah, it could be like um, to highlight certain independent authors. It could say anti bestseller, or like you said, James Patterson. It could be like if you like James Patterson, and then all the books within the same subjects of something that they wrote, instead of highlighting just James Patterson, uh, it's such a large okay. volume. Right. Anyways, I just thought I was thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. So we definitely, oh, I was going to stop at the hour mark because Instagram cuts you off at, at the hour. Oh, I shoot. Cut off. No, it says we're still live. So great. Everyone <laughs> on Instagram is still with us. Um, no, I was going to say um, everyone who is not a big shot author, as they are labeled, has definitely found their own way of having that recommendation. Like, if you like this, you like my book. Or if you like this author, try mine. That's definitely like a tried and true method. I like the anti-bestseller, but as maybe not the best title. But like how, <laughs> how cheap do you get, right? Do you say hashtag worst seller? Like, is that <laughs> kosher? Like, or is it too negative? I, know. I would go, I, I run on spite, so I would do that. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> or I would, I would like an end cap um, for, depending on the author, I would love an end cap if, but it depends on the author if they're cool with it or just put the bad reviews and like actually put them <laughs> yeah. of, of their book because that's also a whole other discussion. I would love to just lean into how funny that would be. <laughs> like so-and-so said, never read this again. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I just like, and I guarantee you, people would pick it up just for that. <laughs> That's true, but would they buy it? That's the thing. <laughs> I think so. I would. 
just for yeah. a giggle. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's a California tactic. <laughs> Uh, excellent. Okay. What about, um, some more resonance topics, characters, um, towards the end of the book? Um, what did you think? Yeah. Anyway, go ahead before I interject more. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just like how the main character, she does talk about, um, committing, to, committing to this decision that she's made. But also reflecting on how change is scary. Yeah. Um, I should have written it down because it's a quote, but I listened to it on audio. But she just talks about how um, so many people aren't willing to to make a change because of fear. Yeah. And she realized that even though she did take a step out the door, it's almost like she had one foot out the door one foot in by not committing completely at least um that was like a conscious choice to say like oh maybe this will be open for two years who knows and um she really had to reach a point where she committed um and kind of like just self-acknowledging that and be like you know what i can't just uh i can't be wishy-washy waffle yeah yeah but i just i love that little revelation at the end mm. her character basically i love the main character and i'm stuck on her <laughs> okay fine <laughs> no um so i i struggle with that i've definitely heard it from other people the whole thing about you can't achieve what you want unless you're in it 100 percent. because like mm. in my experience when I am doing writing, I love the writing part. <laughs> then there's editing, then there's formatting, then there's website, then there's, you know, possible different formats, and then there's different websites to upload to, and then there's different services to pay to like operate a newsletter. And there are so many other things that are not enjoyable. And it's like, how, like, what does it mean to be in it 100%? Do you have to like, devote all your time to all of these things and like go beyond the pale in order to achieve your initial goal of like getting your book into other people's hands to read. Because I feel like if I'm being true to myself, I'm going to prioritize the parts that um, I enjoy and that are easiest. <laughs> Those are like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part of that is laziness. Um, part of that is like maybe not having confidence in the system to support someone's work like mine. Um, and perhaps just like part, not the desperation to like sell hundreds of copies um, because I want it to find the right people. And I don't know. I don't know. So I, I I am somewhat skeptical, but also still sort of, um, what's it called when you lower something into a well to see how far the water is? <laughs> I guess I felt like for her character, it, she was already doing the thing, right? She's already running a bookstore. Yeah. It was more, I felt like her saying that was more of a mental thing because um she made this choice, but I felt like mentally as again, on the conversation of checking in with oneself, she really had to be like mentally commit because then when the way she moves around in the world affects people, like for instance, her telling her employee. Oh yeah. To be full time. Be, like, yeah, but we're going to be probably just two years. So you might be gone. So it's like, so I don't mean, I don't mean it in a way of like how, the logistics of it i just meant she mentally needed to figure out solidly what she wants because that affects other people you know yeah because then she she could then she'll know a whole other level of how is she gonna uh direct her employees now her employee knows all right she's in here for the long haul so so am i and then you know in terms of expectations yeah if yeah. that makes any sense it but I think you can still have that same uncertainty in yeah. terms of 
which efforts are going to be central. Like mm -hmm. for her to stay open, that seems like, okay, that makes sense. That <laughs> you're going to keep going in the direction that you're going. Um, I'm going to keep writing books and publishing books, but um, in terms of like joining a conference, is that the right way to spend my energy? I don't yeah. know. I could waffle on that. Like it's a side <laughs> yeah. part of the brand. It's part of the effort, but I, I'm never sure which thing deserves more attention, you know? So that's like, um, that's part of the struggle for, for me in, in the business, I guess. Mm, no, I yeah. hear you. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, what did you think about the kind of in the background swirling potential for a romance? Yeah. Uh, it was a very slow burn, if you will. <laughs> if it's going to be, I think it would be like slow burn romantic element. It's very small. Yeah. Um, I liked that we had a character where it was like testing a bit of her, um, where she was thinking she had failed before. So we don't know anything about her previous life until very far into the novel. And then we sort of get her finally confronting, why was I so burnt out? Why did I get this far? Um, so that she can move on from that instead of just like ignoring it. And I liked that. I liked the way that that played out. Um, yeah. So if you're not going to talk about the other characters, I'm going to talk about the other characters, at least the ones. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it annoyed me that one of the characters was constantly called someone's mother. For like chapters and yeah. chapters and chapters. And I'm like, this woman needs a name, you know? And then finally, like when she starts to to do things and, and act in her own um, capacity, like she says, I don't want people to call me so-and-so's mother. My name is this. And I was like, finally, that was, that seemed weird to me. Maybe it's more normalized for people with kids in schools. What do you think? Yeah. I was wondering if, if that's, um, because this is the translation. I wonder if that's more of a cultural thing because, um, how do I say this? How people in that particular language, because she does touch upon it, like how people are re have relations that will change how they um, address each other. Refer, Yeah, refer to each other. So I wonder if that element had to do with that. But that's, that's not why. Same. Because like that's when you're calling someone like, hello, older sister, hello, auntie, hello, uncle. Yeah. Like that's when you're addressing people. When you're talking about them, there's no reason to say that's Bobby's mom instead of that's Janet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nope. So the, kid, the kid is a character. He has an interesting yeah. storyline. The mother is a character. She has an interesting storyline. I like how they get like a little book club up, uh, a wine, I should say a wine club. Um, <laughs> And the author is a you know major character, uh, and the coffee employee is a major character. He has a really yeah. interesting arc of understanding and working with the coffee bean lady, and like there's all these different people sort of like bumping into each other. I don't know. I like yeah. I like I like, I like like the 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 knowledge about um, you know how what was it how coffee i think there's like a little bit of a fable when it comes to coffee or just the evolution of him learning about coffee uh-huh and it's i think it's one of them was talking about a particular origin and i really like that i also like that his character i'm really bad at names but i like how his character um there's something that's cool about him he's this very simple easygoing and it's like got it he seems like the perfect employee <laughs> not like I wouldn't be able to be laid laid back with him I'd, I'd feel <laughs> put off you know mm -hmm. with someone who never answered or like act like they didn't care all the time that wouldn't be someone I would get along with very easily <laughs> but then I'm not a perfectionist he is definitely mm -hmm. a perfectionist like he's doing one thing all the time and he figures out oh this is what I'll do I can't do that I just I need like five different things that I can rotate between Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. but I feel like if, if you're the owner of a bookstore then it's like you don't have to ever worry about that other thing that's true because he's, he's got it oh, he's like yeah. I got it unlock <laughs> <laughs> I love it okay 
So then a little bit more diving into the existential societal dread, because that was a piece that I was like, yes, give me more of this in my cozy fiction and make me feel less insane. Um, so one of those pages was page 57, which is maybe here. Nope. 57. Um, Minjun. Is that the person, the kid? No. Okay, so this is the coffee guy. Minjun is the coffee guy. Okay, but he's yeah, yeah. Back when he was younger. Um, and he's sitting, talking to his mom on the phone in his apartment. And his mom's voice sounded unnaturally bright. And he too found himself trying to match her tone. It was a lie, though. He would no plans to tutor, nor did he want to continue looking for a job. He hated the label of a job seeker. He wanted to stop seeking or preparing for things. He hated the feeling of walking on a road with no end in sight or trying to push against a solid wall that wouldn't budge. And I was like, I see you. <laughs> I see you. Oh, my God. Yeah, with that feeling that whatever, you know expectations people had they're not working out and like i'm just what am i going to do continually fail forever is that what you want me to do like yeah how did that hit you when you read that did you i also i also felt like that is very much in vain of the whole book and also maybe how failure is perceived hmm. and also speaks to um reinvention and reinvention can only come through failure, you right? Could, you know, and I felt, um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, um, oh gosh, I wish I could say more than that, but I felt for his character in that moment. I've been his character, <laughs> um, and I also think that uh, that speaks to another case to connect it to their previous book of needing to um, put on, put on a mask at times when you're just trying to figure yourself out, mm. you know, instead of like, I mean, what is he going to tell his mom? <laughs> like, if this isn't where, you know, then that will end up in, in, in a whole other conversation. So it's easier to do just what he did, which is to match your tone. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one of the other pieces, um, so I said one of the other bookshop books was about an older character. And this book is not about an older character, it's about a midlife character, but she does bring in people from different walks of life and different ages and different sort of socioeconomic status, et cetera. So I like how she brings in a diverse group. Um, there's the kid who's in like secondary school. There's um, Minjun, the coffee guy who is postgraduate, but not in a, having not chosen what to do with his life yet. You know, that's an empty choice. Um, but then we've also got, um, I forget who she's talking to here, actually. Wushik. Um, I think it's one of the people who are in their, like, book and wine club. But it's the mm -hmm. part I read during the interview a couple days ago, um, but with a little more context. So this is a woman in her 50s. Uh, when I was young, I thought that sacrificing myself and accommodating others was part of my duty. It's good to see the younger ones these days thinking differently. And this person responded, well, it's not that we see things differently, but at least we need to see a glimmer of hope at the end of that sacrifice. But these days, there's not even a shred of hope. So we don't see a need to sacrifice anymore. The younger one chimed in. The older lady was shocked. Is it that bad? She asked, <laughs> looking at them in turn, and they nodded. That actually may be at their book club because they had a lot of different people at the book club at one point. Yeah. But I liked how that was like bringing in different generations to actually see each other because I think sometimes nowadays we can talk about, you know, Gen X, Gen Z, Boomer, and we sort of categorize people and we say this is what they think. And, you know, we don't give them the space to be individual generationally. Like we do that in lots of other cross-cutting ways as well but in terms of the generations for me I've definitely experienced the inability to get past um 
people assuming that you will go a certain way with your life. Or once you make a decision, your future is set. And you're like, that's not how it works anymore. And this is exactly, you know, what their generations are sort of struggling to communicate, not past each other, but actually grapple with. And I really liked that. Yeah, that also speaks to, um, I'll just go there. It, it speaks to the economy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, some people call it like the affection of it, the gig economy. And, oh, and it's yeah. because it's not the system that worked for so long for some people, it's not working anymore. And um, so, yeah, people have to have five different trades <laughs> of things yeah. to get by. And it's um for so long it worked for one generation the boomer the post-war boom yeah. generation in america that's true that's true that's very true we just and thought it would last forever yeah exactly yes expecting it to continue and to continue to work i'm like no the world changes <laughs> every day <laughs> the world's still spinning <laughs> on this rock yes. yeah <laughs> and um that would be nice it would be nice but um yeah that definitely explains speaks to, um, you know, when you have community and it comes together in all these varying ways, it's a way to connect things that maybe they wouldn't have before. So, I, yeah, I love that element yeah. of, of generational connection, you know, and that happens even when you go in the working field, there's people of all ages yeah. and you come together um, for one particular, not necessarily a goal, but in this, it would be community and um, gives opportunity to also face things in a way that maybe wouldn't come up any other way. Yeah. It, yeah, it's interesting because um, one of the other uh, booktubers I know, Katya Weinert, who came in at the end of the discussion because it was 3 a.m. where she was and she fell asleep, <laughs> but she had sent me a couple of questions beforehand. And one of them was, was this book at all a reflection of your observations of soul community or neighborhood in any particular? And I thought that was really neat. And her answer, Borum's answer was that, well, it's more of like an ideal version because you have all these different elements coming together and it's a bit happy. And yeah, people are struggling to figure things out, but you don't often have a third place like a bookstore that is that open and, um, you know, successful enough to keep going so that people feel able to open up and engage in that way. And like book club takes off and like her Instagram takes off and her blog column is like syndicated. you like, all these things are like <laughs> successful and you're like, mm -hmm, yeah, that'd be nice. Um, <laughs> Which is why this is a cozy read. <laughs> right. Exactly. Very happy, very happy read. Um, but yeah, so uh, I liked that question. I thought that was good. Um, critiques or confusions or things that you wished for more of or less of anything? Um, I don't, mm, let me think. Um, no, I, I don't really have any critiques because this was a cozy read. Um, I even, believe it or not, because I'm not much of a romance person, typically I would say I didn't really care for the potential romantic elements, but I actually didn't mind because they seem to be kind of like what you touched upon. Um, they were there to actually challenge the main character in a way about what she thinks and feels, not just where she's at, um, but the decisions that she's made in her own life with her her estranged husband or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It's a great book for people who have trouble making decisions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. More, more of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't have any particular cri critiques. I, I wish I did, but I just enjoyed it from beginning to end. And it was just a surprisingly um, joyful, thoughtful, read I really appreciated how there were these um there's a conversation right when people would have uh when we read a book and then they would talk about those different elements in a book and um 
challenge each other's ideas about something in a book. It would just, I just, I just loved it. What about you, Margaret? <laughs> um, me too. I mean, aside from the fact that she didn't put the secret of having an effortless Instagram feed that like people naturally <laughs> follow in the book, <laughs> you know, that was missing. Uh, other than that, I, I mean, yeah. 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 It's a book set in a bookshop. <laughs> Yeah. And it's what else do you need? written. And there's sympathetic characters who go through things that we all go through. So, um, yeah, I really liked it. It was a good one. It was a good one. Yeah. Um, what else do we have to talk about? <laughs> You're like, um, what's next? Anything what's up next? Like yeah. What are you working on? Oh, gosh. Well, I threw off my schedule by reading this but then also my uh, my you know outside of book life is kind of crazy yeah. um i don't have the book for me book life what's that <laughs> exactly i wish it was like that yeah. i'm still reading my nonfiction read for um talking about uh some of the history of boyle heights that's kind mm -hmm. of uh just east of los angeles where i'm at mm -hmm. um actually it's, it's right next to east l.a so I'm still reading that. It's a nonfiction read. It looks huge. It looks daunting. But actually, I took a peek and I realized there's so much of a section of it that's all references. Yeah. So I was like, yes, <laughs> I can get through this. Yeah. <laughs> so it was actually just only 261 pages. So I'm going to get through that. I don't have it handy. And um, let me scooch back real quick. Mm -hmm. Let me grab this one. After that which I should finish up by the month is Lies My Teacher Told Me by James W. Lowell, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong, which is right up my alley. I love being told that everything I know is wrong <laughs> because I'm going to agree. So yeah, um, also, if anybody is interested in reading the reformatory that we talked earlier, or you just like uh, Tenerife Dew's work, I would also suggest you read south central noir she does have a short story in there um i also did a review not too long ago about that and after that to reward myself i will be reading a couple of um light yeah yeah, yeah. um once i'm done with my first self my first shelf which is behind me i'm going to be reading a couple of new releases to reward myself which is womb city by Toloto Samasi yeah. and then Camilla Cole's So Let Them Burn. Wow, I've heard about both of those as like two yeah. raves. Yeah, nice. And then Promise Boys by Nick Brooks. I've never read a dark, dark, dark how do you say it? Dark Academia book yeah. before, but this is within that genre. So I'm going to read that. And then after that, uh, the last reward before I go on to my next shelf is going to be, um, I'm reading a collection of Margaret's books. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to be really reading your trilogy. I'm going to be reading um, um, the Stygian collection. collection. Is that, what is it called? The Stygian. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then I also then want to read Fable Passages. I think that was your most recent. Yes. Right? Yes, yes. it is. So I decided I want to add that. So that actually might be something that I want to push to April and just dedicate that month to it. To your work <laughs> basically this is so weird i'm talking to the author about that i'm gonna be reading her work <laughs> should this be happening i don't know <laughs> so margaret there's this author i learned about <laughs> it also has a youtube channel and it's very exciting april is my birthday month so like that's oh, my yeah. birthday present. <laughs> okay cool well with that said not that i should really ask you on air i figured maybe at the end of the maybe at the end of April, whatever your schedule looks like, maybe you come on to my channel and talk about your books. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Or we can dual we can dual stream whatever you're comfortable yeah. with. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, and I'll be back in Portland in April, so that uh, yeah, 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 rushing around everywhere and trying to clean a refrigerator and set mousetrap. <laughs> yeah, clean out mold from the dishwasher. <laughs> oh, oh man, that's gonna be an adventure. It's it was a surprise treat when I arrived. Beautiful old house, but you know, sometimes yeah. it can get itself into trouble. 
Um, <laughs> that sounds awesome. That's a lot of great nonfiction. And then like my fiction to look forward to in April. <laughs> uh, so what am I working on? I've got the Irish readathon that I'm now highlighting now that I've gotten the reformatory finished. Um, I've got a couple of fiction reads that I no, I've got one fiction read that I've started. I've got a nonfiction that I've started. So one is Dervla Murphy's Full Tilt. It's an Irish woman on a bicycle who tries to bike from Ireland to India. And obviously she does. It was from 1965. So it's like period piece, nonfiction, travel lit. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, basically, she spent all her time talking about day by day travel diary for Iran and Afghanistan so far, which is like, what? So interesting. Um, and the fiction I've started is my audiobook, which is The Rachel Incident. And mm. it's interesting because you know what you said about To Kill a Mockingbird, but in the actual person's point of view who's experiencing it instead of the white person's. I was thinking about this. The Rachel Incident is written uh, in the point of view of a white woman but her best friend is a gay man and she's going through this thing where she's kind of talking about herself as the main character, but realizing that he's the main character of her life story. And you're like, this is interesting. I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't know how this is going to turn out. This is pretty crazy. So it's good. It's a good lesson. Um, so that's the Irish readathon. And then I came back from a trip recently where I did a lot of research stuff. And so on my little schedule of research trip report outs, my next video is going to be March 20th, which is Wednesday. And that's going to have the vlog, which I have not started yet, of <laughs> bookshop tour and the booktuber meetup. So that'll be exciting because I met up with three booktubers in Glasgow and I went to a bunch of bookshops. I talked a little bit about them on the book haul video, but like I'll show you the pictures because I took a lot of pictures too. <laughs> um, so that's coming up. And then I am part of the March Madness sprinting. So I haven't done any writing in March, but uh, I will be doing my sprint on the 22nd. So Friday morning as part of Chelsea CM Lockhart and Ash. Ash writes lots. Big March effort to, to write a lot of words. So they're doing a great job sprinting almost every day and Monday to Friday. And I'm doing one little piece so I can like be part of it. <laughs> so yeah. That'll be this Friday. Oh my goodness. But the two blaze books are done. I was super nervous about those. And like the reformatory the black author tuber book is finally done. So <laughs> yeah, that was a, with all those cities, that was a challenge. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad that like, whoo, I feel like I'm finally in March now, you know, like I've, I can start processing everything. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. March. So basically you're free the whole month. <laughs> it's March 16th. Like yeah. it's happening. <laughs> yeah. I'm finally yeah. here, everybody. <laughs> yeah. That's why I ended up pushing also why I ended up pushing your books to April. I was like, I only want one month to dedicate to it because I'm just juggling too much. And yeah. I don't I also don't want to feel like again, I'm talking to the author. This is the word. I just don't want to feel like I'm gonna speed through your work. I wanna like really take the time. Yeah. To be attentive. And that's basically how I feel about any time I do like an author focused um, segment. And Are that you just a wasn't gonna... person? <laughs> yes. A corner turned down person or both? Because I did both in this book. I don't really, tr I don't really dog ear. I do use those little, the labels quite a bit. And I, I love a highlighter. Oh, <laughs> I love yeah. to highlight nice. and write notes in and uh, write notes on like a separate book, like over here. I've uh -huh. completely abandoned buying an actual like formatted version and just, but I also think I like the version that you have. You have the one where it's more uh, longer in, in width. You I have, don't know. One of your, one of your books you showed me, it was like this way instead. The way I, you log. Yeah. I turn it side. I think it was just graph paper. So it's like a graph paper yeah. pad and when I need to do a timeline thing or like something that's one long thing that just continues, I just yeah. turn it sideways. I need a, it's called large format. I'll either do a big piece yeah. of paper, like butcher paper, or I'll just turn graph paper to the side or whatever. Yeah. That works for brainstorming. 
Yeah, but tradition. I've tried other, um, you know, books that are marketed that are specific for writing notes, and they're all too small. Hmm. I, I'm like, I need well, like five pages of book. Pages are too small. Yeah, the pages. It's like only one page per book, and I'm like, oh no, this is not going to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm like, I just yeah. need some plain paper <laughs> that can go yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I had one book journal that I got from a publisher from a giveaway and it had like half a page. And I was like, mm -hmm. nope. do you not know your, your audience? <laughs> I don't know. Some people are, are concise, just not us. I, yeah. <laughs> not when it comes to reading, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <sighs> All right, so that was coming attractions in case you you were unclear. And yeah, I what else? Do you have anything else you want to say? How's life? Um, oh my goodness. I haven't scheduled it yet. I genuinely want to make sure I get through these two big books. But I was debating and speaking of indecisiveness, yeah, about having a wrap up. I think I'm gonna have a wrap up and talk about my next TBR and kind of touch upon um the author focus um, month because I'm just, I'm changing things up a little bit by doing that. Um, so that will be probably towards the end of the month, but I think I'm going to do that. So that's the only other thing I have in the pipeline. Um, outside book two, my life is pure chaos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding on. I um, You're being basically... dictated to by your teenage daughter via Google Calendar. Yes. That's what I hear. <laughs> Yes, we had we had appointments this morning, and then we came home. We both crashed. So before mm -hmm. I did this, we were just asleep. We, I, I just there was no waking up. We just crashed so hard. I woke up before and saw my. That's rare for my daughter because she um, she's an early bird and she's up till she hits the pillow. That's it. Yeah. So we are both tired. Her yeah. Naps don't exist for her. I wish they did. <laughs> But then she's a teenager, so of course she's not napping. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Saturday. I'm just gonna survive Saturday's... a teenager. Yeah, <laughs> Saturday's a good day for a nap. That's, you can pass that on from me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. What about you, Margaret? Uh, today. Yeah. Um, well, I already did my two most important things today, which was this stream with you and going to the bakery in Los Osos. So there's a bakery. Actually, yeah. I'm wearing their shirt. Oh. <laughs> you represent. <laughs> wayward, wayward bakery. Yep. In Los Osos. And they just have divine pastries, croissants, bread, cheesecake, everything. Um, so I rewarded myself first because life is uncertain. And then I came back and got to work with like the dishwasher and jewelry and the bleach and just all the stuff that needs to be done here yeah so yeah. in case you were wondering i'm at a new location it's the place it's the house that i grew up in my parents live part-time here and part-time in like a, a smaller one floor house because my mom can't walk upstairs anymore and it's closer to my sister so it's like safer um, but we still have this house and they, they are here some of the time for like business management and that kind of stuff. So I love being here. It's where I grew up. I can walk around the downtown. San Luis Obispo is a beautiful place. It's got beautiful weather and I like spending time here. Um, but the fact that it's only lived in part time means that like there's all these little crises that emerge. So I am here to help with that as part of my fourth job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got to give the TLC. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, you know, like the freezer fails and my um, dad and brother were here and they stuffed all the stuff in the fridge. Well, now the fridge is leaking. So it's like, mm. oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> Pay the piper another, time. Yeah. Another reason I look at YouTube is just like, it's basically YouTube University. All the things I've looked to, like Mickey Mouse fixed my place. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Um, yeah. So just lots of little things. Um, but yeah, two most important things are done. So I'm just going to bop around to having a cookie, cleaning some jewelry, having, you know, I don't <laughs> know, going in for a walk out in the lovely sun and then come back and put out some more mousetraps or like bleach some more counters or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for actually reaching out to me to do the uh, fanning. That was lovely. I've never done that before. <laughs> yeah, it was super fun. You did great for your first time. So um, for other, authors, other authors that you think would might, you know, might want to come on the channel and you want to meet them. Hey, we can oh, always. Thank you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um. Yeah. So thank you for having our little chat and buddy reading these books for the readathon and for just pleasure. Um, that is our ramble a thon of our two buddy reads. That was super fun. So we'll end yeah. it here. So Instagram won't get mad at us for going over two hours. And <laughs> thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Happy reading.